Welcome to Creatives in Quarantine. I'm Tawana Floyd, your host. This week, I speak with actor, writer, improviser, Monica Smith, who retired from traveling the world as a fashion model to pursue comedic bits, becoming an alumni of the Second City Toronto at 19 years old. She's been improvising ever since and known to bring a room to uproarious laughter with one succinct quip. Here's Monica. Monica Smith, welcome to Creatives in Quarantine. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness, I have, I have so many questions to ask you, but before we even get started, um, we could talk about how we met. Do you remember how we met? I know we met at Second City, but yeah. I don't know if I could specifically say when. Well, I can tell you specifically when. because It was about 2000, maybe 11 or 12, and I was just about to go into the grad program um, in Second City in my improv conservatory. And I wasn't feeling like I knew what I was doing to, to make sketches. So I took your diagnostic class mm. and then you opened a whole new world for me by, by breaking down the, 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 I guess the technique of game by just saying it's the mo the first odd thing you hear. And I was like, what? All this, I, I just spent like almost two years here and nobody broke it down that simple. And I, it's just, been eluding me all all the all along up until that moment so um and then ever since then I've just been rocking with you oh nice that's very yeah. lovely yeah I feel like we all say the same thing it's just the way one person says it will connect for you so I always try and like rephrase it repeatedly yeah. and, it, and it could have been like little seeds here and there and then finally but I don't know I, I think it was just the way that you um that you gave it to me was the easiest way for me to comprehend and so since we're talking about improv, because I know you as an improviser and an actor, but you have a whole other background as well as a model. And so, you know what, just tell me, just tell me your journey. How did you go from this kid in high school to model, to actor, to improviser? Um, I was always funny. I was always the funny kid because I was the weird <laughs> kid and the shy kid. So you know what I mean? Like comedy was always there. Mm -hmm. um, and then... The reason I went to New York for modeling, I was, a, I was in a mall, I was at the Eaton Center, downtown Toronto, and like I used to get stopped all the time, and mm. people would be like, hey, you should model, here's my card. And mm -hmm. like I kept having it happen all the time, but it's a shady business. Yeah. Um, and then for some reason, this one woman, I took her card home, and she, it's, I can't remember what the term is called, she sells you? So she discovers you, and then she like sells you to agencies, a recruiter, yeah. So she sold mm -hmm. me to, I think it was Ford Model, I think I started, oh, at, I started, great. I went to American Model Ford and then Elite, something like that. And she mm -hmm. sold me to one of them. And I was in New York. I did a photo shoot. And you know how they say like, oh, you need to take makeup classes or walking classes. Whenever someone tells me their kid's doing that, I'm just like, quit. It's, that's yeah. not how it works. Because right. I was flown to New York within, I'm sorry, uh, within two weeks. And then I was in New York at 15. Damn, that was fast. Yeah. So what was it about that woman where you was like, this one feels legitimate? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think I had met, I had met with, now I'm forgetting his name, the head of elite in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I had met with them. I think it was also just going to New York. My, my parents are also very pro that kind of stuff. Like go. Um, yeah. So I didn't have anyone stopping me or anything. So yeah, I went and uh, it was in, I think in the summer or right before summer started in high school. And then that's mm -hmm. it. That's it. I started modeling like that and going back and forth flying between New York and Toronto. And then I wouldn't tell anybody because you get made fun of. It's such a different world. Like I imagine if I grew up now with Instagram, like I hid that I modeled. Yeah. I didn't let people see magazines or like the wow. reason people found out because a friend of mine, like either they saw an ad or they ratted me out. I can't remember which. Because mm -hmm. I would lie and say I'm going to visit my grandmother who's sick. And I only have one grandmother and she wasn't sick. Um, yeah. So it was like a whole thing to like hide it because people would make fun of me. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't tell anybody. And yeah. Because I was also like really shy and funny. But those were like my weird little things. So you were this undercover model for, for a very long time. You were in the closet model. Pretty much. And now I'm in the closet now. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it never leaves. Nothing's changed. <laughs> I was also, I feel like there's a caveat. I can't ever talk about my life without going, and I was sick. So, and I have an autoimmune disease and I was very ill for many mm -hmm. years. So it's also that. I think it was a, it was, it's a interesting dichotomy because it was 
on a runway, at a photo shoot, doing a Calvin Klein thing, and then in bed, feeling oh. sick, going mm-hmm. to different specialists and doctors, and then also going to high school. Um, yeah. H- had you found out that you had an autoimmune while you were modeling, or you knew that already growing up as a kid? I was sick as a kid, and we didn't know why. And uh-huh. it was like, as a kid, it was like, oh, you get the chicken pox. I get them for two months. Like, it would be things where I would just get sick all the time. And then mm-hmm. I got um, strep throat eight times in, like, mm-hmm. six months or something. Mm-hmm. And I was just, every part of my body was falling apart. So I was going yeah. to specialist after specialist, and they were all misdiagnosing it, wrongly mm-hmm. diagnosing it, or going, you're just a pretty girl. You're, that's oh, not pain. You know, a lot of pain. that. Wow. Um, a lot Even of that. It's just because you're, because you look a certain way. But not it makes, common. right? It's not uncommon. It yeah. happens, um, you know what I mean? Especially reading now about how often it's happening to Black America and it's just like, yeah. all, or like pregnancy rates here. Oh my God. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. So obviously this happens. My journey is like this version of it. My dad once said, he's like, well, people don't think you're in pain because you're pretty. Oh my God. I was like, I think that makes, I think that's what happened. I think a lot of doctors were like, yeah, but you're, you're pretty. And that, I hold it. I don't show it. I'm top, like, you know what I mean? I'm right. not going to, I'm not right. one to like cry in public. So mm-hmm. I don't know. So then I would think that the heavy demand, because the, it sounds like your, your modeling career took off really quickly and um, what, was it just New York or were you traveling to like France and Italy as well? I traveled a bit more. We didn't, I didn't like, it's so secretive. I like didn't even tell my family when I would travel further. It was so secretive. Uh, I don't know why I did that. Um, yeah, so uh, I keep looking down because my dog is at my feet. Um, yeah, we're going to want to see Felix at some point. Yeah, I know. So. I'll pick him up later. Okay. All right. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, so I, I traveled a bit and then it was just back to Toronto. So always going back to school. Mm-hmm. yeah summers away back to school or when I was too ill I'd stop or like mm-hmm. so yeah it was a lot of a lot of that and then somebody I grew up watching SCTV in Canadian right so our TV we get Monty Python SCT was brilliant kids in the hall mm-hmm. I didn't get Mr. Show or at least I didn't even know it existed um and so that definitely had an influence on me and then I started taking classes at Second City in Toronto Okay. How old were you when you were, were you a kid at this point? 19, 18. Yeah. Wow. 17, you found it early. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Teenager, something around there. Um, mm-hmm. I found it and I started taking classes <laughs> there and I'm so sorry. Uh, and it just connected. I'm sorry. He's going to just be a dick today. Um, come here. Hey, let's go. We're loose. We're loose and free here. I've, I've had, I've had spouses pop, pop up. I've had right, kids pop this. up. Your kid can pop up too. Oh, how about this? Maybe he just wants some attention. That's right. Yeah. He's like, who are you talking to? Are there you crazy? You go. Oh, Felix! There you go, bud. Okay, so now we have to introduce Felix and talk about this Felix for a moment. Felix Smith. Um, he's going to jump because <laughs> he hates it. Uh, yeah. That's it. He has my dog. Instagram. <laughs> he has his own Instagram. Because otherwise, everything I do is taking a photo of my dog. Right? right. Like, it just becomes right. the thing you do. Right. Um, yeah, now he's chill. Yes, hi. Okay. Um, hello, buddy. Uh, yeah, so that was sort of the high school experience, and then Second City just connected because mm-hmm. I got into Turco before I finished conservatory. Oh, um, wow. And talk, so what is Turco? I'm not really clear on what that is because they don't have that in Hollywood, those have different tiers of it. So I was in the low high school tier. So okay. we would travel to um, high schools and grade mm-hmm. schools and perform for them. And I remember I had to like, I rap. And so I would sing and rap and do like Avril Lavigne shit at the time. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was like doing bits and then improv. And then at the end of the show, you'd improvise with students and you bring them up on stage and stuff. And so we would get in a van and drive across Toronto or stuff. I believe it was $65 a show. <laughs> Something oh, like that. That's nice. Um, I, it was a little change. change. A little pocket yeah, change. Yeah, it was a little pocket change. Yeah. Um, I got us to name our conservative pro- our, uh, our class show. So for anyone who doesn't know, in Second City, it's like a two-year program. You go through like one level, and then you go through a bunch of conservatory levels. And so I got my class to calculate how much we all spent and we titled our show, The Price It Cost Us to Go Through the Program. 
So our show, our final grad show, okay. where everyone has like great fun puns. Ours was like the $28,000, 700 and blah, 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 <laughs> student. And then like, they were not happy with that. <laughs> of course not. Right. How, yeah. Yeah. That's, what? No. Yeah. Make a mockery out of other things, but don't parody what we charge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like we skipped the step because I, f I feel like I got to pull the modeling part out of you because I really want to know more about that. Well, actually, we don't have to go too, too deep in. I guess my question is, when did you just say I had enough with modeling and then this improv is pulling me? If it was improv or if it was just something else? Um, I think it's a mix of things. Modeling was good money. So you know what I mean? I could pay off stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was sick. And illness took over. And so there, gotcha. there's just times where I was too sick to do things. So then I wouldn't work. And then I could work and I would do a modeling thing. Mm -hmm. um, also, I don't, the industry, I feel like whatever they say about acting, the industry is so much worse than modeling when it comes to creepos. Um, so you right. add in that level, which again, I handled, yeah. but like um, all of that, sometimes it was just nice to not be seen as just an object. Like, especially Understood. being quick and funny, being like, no, but I have other things, uh, yeah. other attributes. Right. So, yeah, I think, and it was a thing of like, oh, if you model, you won't be able to act. Models aren't taken seriously. It was such a weird, it's a that different divide. Time. Yeah. Like, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I had all of that going through my head and uh, improv has just consistently brought me joy. And so when I started doing improv, I just, you know what I mean? I think you're the same where you just found it and you're like, oh, I mm -hmm. love this. Yeah, and like I just created this family, a community of friends, and then I was performing a ton all the time. And we would do like we started doing shows in bars, and we would start our own thing. And we drove to Chicago together. Like I just had this like yeah. connection with people to do this thing. Right. So I think I, yeah. I leaned into that more. That makes sense. I feel like um, <laughs> I didn't learn about improv really, although I watched SCTV as a kid. I watched. SNL, the original cast, and you know, growing up, and there was a show called Fridays as well. And so I didn't really know what that was. I just knew that I liked it. And it wasn't until I moved to LA in 2005 that I saw a building called the Groundlings. And I was like, wait, I think Phil Hartman went there. And I ran mm -hmm. into the building with my friend. She's like, what is this place? And I'm like, they, they, I didn't know they had a school, you know? And so then started researching uh, the origin and then found out the Second City really was the birthplace of it. So then that's why I chose Second City and did some time at the Groundlings as well. But what I learned um, when I was in New York before moving to L.A., my, my childhood best friend, we're still friends to this day, is a stand-up comic. And so um, she, all of a sudden she decided that she wanted to be a comic out of nowhere. And, and it was shocking to all of us, all of her friends, because we never knew her to even want to have a career. And so we were on this ski trip and she decided, I'm going to ask if I can get, do a set tonight. And we're like, what? And she did it in front of like a thousand people and did really well. But I tell that story because um, when she would like do like little sets here and there around New York City, I would always go with her because I wanted to get in for free. That was <laughs> that was really it. And I yeah. had a car, so so it worked out. But I recognized that the comedy um, community was much more embracing and um, much more of a family than I felt actors were, where actors are always solo and pursuing on their own. So now coming to LA and then being a part of the improv community, um, I, I feel like the improv community is even more of a family than um, stand-up uh, community, but I don't know, I'm not fully immersed in that, but I can only talk about improv. And you, know, you were talking about there were so many things that you could do, it's like, you have control to create whatever you want to create. Yeah. And you, you modeled, right? Cause you, or you danced. You know, I, I was a dancer and people, it was the same thing. People would approach me all the time about dancing. And I just, I mean, about modeling and I just couldn't take it seriously enough. And then I think kind of like you, cause I read on your website, I like to eat and I always felt like, Oh, I'm not going to be able to do it if I have to stop eating. Um, so I dabbled a little bit, but never took it seriously. Okay, yeah. I've just seen you post some very beautiful, yeah. either you. dance music videos or something where I'm like, oh, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Who was this girl? Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, right. We're all, we all have different, different parts of our lives. So, so then how did you transition? Well, actually, how did you get to Los Angeles from, from Canada and going back and forth to New York? Um, I had to come here and stay. 
I, I think since I was little, I, I always said I was going to leave. Like I told my parents, I won't be living here. And I love, I'm very proud Canadian. So I love my country, yeah. but it just, there was something more. Um, and so I got through the conservatory. I got on Torco. I had, I would like do some commercials. I was, you know, modeling and anyone who I looked up to who was funny left. Oh. or was in a commercial and that was the, that was like the funniest people that I saw at uh, ah, at um, Second City were in commercials and yeah. I was like but there's so much more that we could be doing in this industry yeah. mm -hmm. he's gonna jump um yeah so that kind of was shocking to me do you know what I mean where I was like yeah. oh the only way to get ahead is to go further so I was either gonna go to London and go to like theater because it's a commonwealth or I was like well go right. back to New York because I love New York and I just always assumed at some point I'd go to New York again mm -hmm. and then I decided LA because of TV yeah honestly it's just right it was like that yeah. seems like the right move so I literally I think I left in like around February I was like all right I just made a date made a plan and was like this is the day I'll leave by and then left and then you came here and, and then so I came did you, here did you go straight to Second City or did you like I find your way did. around town a bit? I went to Second City and the AD at the time, uh, I was like, hey, you know, I toured and I was like doing, I was doing multiple shows at, it was mm -hmm. called Tim Sims Playhouse and all this stuff in Toronto. I would like to perform. And he's like, yeah, we don't need any more performers. Mm -hmm. If you want to take a class, you can. And I was like, oh no, I already graduated the program and I've toured and blah, blah. And he was like, no. And so Second City kind of didn't welcome me. Um, uh -huh. And then, yeah. And then I started wow. doing comedy with like just, indie groups and there used to be this theater um this show called garage comedy and charlene Yee would do it and um i think josh fadem like it was like sort of eclectic weird brandon johnson so we would all do weird bits on stage mm -hmm. and i started doing that and then i was like oh ucb exists so i got to ucb probably uh. a little under a year after it had started and then ucb definitely became my community and my family and then i would also perform at io and i bumped into josh funk Mm -hmm. one night and he was the ad at the time and he like, was like why do here yeah he was like why do i never see you at second city and i was like because i was told i'm not like sort of fully and he was like come over and then he was yeah. like do you want to teach and he was wonderful yeah yeah he was like you should be way. there performing and that was great too because second city as you know was such a community for a while mm -hmm. like i could just go there and sit and chill so like i yeah. had that community and then very grateful i was doing like three shows a week at ucb so i had that community mm -hmm. so it ended up being like my entire life and then you know auditions yeah yeah i was just thinking i was surprised to hear the ad that when you because i know that josh is always like the moment that he hears like a, any alumni from no matter which city um he's like well come and teach <clears throat> he's very embracing that way so whoever that other person was oh well but it worked out it happens yeah that's yeah, what i'm saying exactly. i'm not like naming names because i'm not trying to be like yeah no i don't whatever don't, yeah i'm just saying like yeah that just happened to me and um in in a way that's probably good because i went to ucb and i committed exactly all right. my energy to them and like it paid off that was like a great yeah. community and like yeah. yeah nothing's ever in vain i think so so then so you started teaching at Second City first or UCB mm -hmm. or in tandem? Second, Second City first. Second City and then first. at some point you decided or did you go to UCB and it's like, hey, I'm teaching over here. I'd like to teach over um, here. Yeah, I think I taught at Second City for a while first and then I started writing curriculums and then I started selling curriculums and then I would write a workshop oh. or two for IO. And mm -hmm. then I wrote like a lot of the Second City. I wrote the long form program there the acting, wow. the improv program, the wow. um, kids sketch, kids improv. So I just started writing a bunch of curriculums. And this at the time, history. yeah. What do you mean? This back of the day, you mean? It's history because I didn't know that you were writing curriculums. Yeah, and you get paid like uh, 150 bucks. Want to write this yeah. class? And yeah. at the time, yeah. I was like, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's why like, I would start inventing improv games and doing all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm trying to think what happened. Something at UCB. I was just like, hey, I've been, you know, I've been doing all of this. I would love to start teaching. At the time, there used to be a weirdness between improv theaters many years ago. Right. You couldn't perform at multiple places. Like Brian yeah. Gallivan and I were the only ones who were kind of, not to say allowed, accepted. Over. Yeah, because I had weekly shows at both theaters. Mm -hmm. And there was somebody else who had a show at IO. But yeah, there was just a time back in the day where it wasn't as accepted, if you recall. Mm -hmm. He's going to yeah. jump off. Go. Get. 
Go, do it, you live. I'll, I'll, I'll jump when I, when I feel like jumping. Yeah. I feel like jumping now. Now I'm ready. And now go get your bone. Um, yeah. So while that weirdness was happening, I couldn't uh, teach at UCB. And then at some point, that just all changed. I don't know what happened. It was just realizing yeah. there's a lot of talent and we're going to perform or we can get on stage. Yeah. So you can't try to hold us to this um, imaginary exclusive contract in your mind. Yeah. And also we're not getting paid at any of them. So <laughs> it's not part, like, right? now you, yeah. It's not like I'm like, I got to go to Iowa and make some money. No one was yeah, paying. Right. <laughs> so it was just like, either way, I'm going to just yeah. get on stage. Right. Yeah. So when you came to LA, how did you find that small group of people? I don't even know. I think mm -hmm. I found, I think I started with some lady improv sketch team and I joined them and I wrote a show with them. I'm still friends with one of them. Um, and then from that, I met people at like these really, I was just going to indie theaters. I was like looking up improv and any indie thing to go to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then garage comedy stuck out uh, and everyone was funny and weird. Like I, I, I like people were doing, I remember Charlene Yee holding a tennis ball and cutting a slit in it and then just making it a puppet. And like, you know, just really weird. Kulop uh, would hosted it for a while. So yeah, it was like, I could get on stage and do a weird character. I could get on stage. And at the time I was doing way more sketch and character big stuff. At some point I picked improv over sketch. Um, but at the time I was loving sketch and writing. So yeah, I don't know how I found it. And then from that crew, a lot of them were like, hey, we're at UCB. And then UCB let me like start at like a level two. And then I took a couple classes and got on a Herald team. Understood. Yeah, I know... I mean, I, although I met you at Second City, in my head, you were this UCB teacher that happened to come over to Second City, but I didn't know the full scope of how, how you had started. And so then how did you get to China teaching improv? Somebody watched me perform, I think, and then emailed and I, um, I emailed her back and we started talking and like, they, I guess they had talked to a couple of people or interviewed a few people to go there. And I have a good history with writing curriculum. So then it, it worked out. And then I went for, I think, over a month the first time, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because it was never like a bucket list of mine to go to China or anything. I imagine not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience and like culturally amazing and mm -hmm. learning and like also connecting with humans um, where we don't speak the same language, but like, right. you know, comedy, it, uh, some people say that comedy is not the same in other countries and I disagree. I disagree. Yeah. I think all I of us laugh that. at a fart. All of us feel shame. <laughs> all of us feel embarrassment. We do. We, do. we just treat yeah. it differently. And there they had, they had things they leaned towards a little bit more because of the environment and the politics going on. Right. Just yeah. like we have our things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we had that. Just the, Those were obviously different things to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And then they were so eager to learn. And then I kept going back a few times because I like help them write and then direct their sketch show so that they could oh, like man. tour with it. And then I wrote their curriculum and then um, got some other UCB teachers to come out and teach for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a nice experience. Like a, I can, yeah, to see the country. And also, to, I don't know if, you, if you've done it, but to travel alone no, in I a country. No, I alone yet, yeah. As a woman, I have, and it's not always the greatest, and I will say right. China, I felt like Beijing, I felt very safe. Oh, okay. You don't get catcalled. You don't get like you, the degree yeah. to which people follow you on a normal street. Right. In comparison, like people would shove children near me and walk away and take photos because <laughs> I'm like this super tall, oh, white blonde right. lady. So I get that. But I wasn't getting, yeah, it was cool. It was just cool to like go days where I'm like, I'm not going to talk to anybody or the little bit I will would be a lot of like intimate connection through a few words. Yeah. I love that. That was a lovely experience. And so, so then were you teaching with an interpreter? Or how yeah. How does that translate? How does that work? Are there any delays or latency? In there is. And then they also have a lot of fables. Um, I don't know if I, I, I want to like, um, they would have like 
I don't know, like culturally, they might have a story about the rabbit that tried too hard. I'm making this up, but something in that right. mm-hmm. way. So when you do, oh, like the rabbit, they could throw away that sentence and everyone would know what it would mean. And the interpreter oh. would have to be like, oh, like the rabbit. So, and then he'd have to like, or she would have to do this whole long story about explaining this fable to go, that's what that reference is. Now back to the scene. Okay. Yeah. So at one point I had two translators. Um, and, I, uh, and then at some point you learned like, it got a little bit easier. I tried to learn the language, but of course it's Mandarin. It's one of the hardest languages in the world. Yeah, so. right, yeah. Yeah, I can say like a few words. Um, but also connection. Like we would connect and really talk about it. And what did you feel when you said that? What was funny to you? So I think we had those moments. Right. I think yeah. the thing about improv is listening and, and paying close attention. So then you can pick up on, on clues of the idea of where you think somebody is going. Yeah, and object work, they were amazing at because they're theater actors and they're very committed. Oh. And um, the business there is very hard too. Like they don't have a union saying how many hours wow. you can work. So they mm-hmm. just work, you know? And it is like a sort of a third world, first world in one city where I was at least. Mm-hmm. So having all of that happening was um, a lot. Like I, I, they were definitely like tried hard, worked hard and took a note and were, you know? So that was really nice, especially like coming in and they don't know me, Yeah, you know, yeah. they don't have to, but there is such a level of respect that was lovely and like connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You how know, long, how long ago was that? Um, I don't even know. I'm bad with years. Something about me. Okay. Um, I am. I'm very bad with years and ages and numbers, <laughs> uh, but everything else. Um, I think it was. Gosh, I don't know, 2016, 2015. Mm-hmm. I went the first time for over a month and then I went a couple more times because then one time I like would, you know, go there and then travel or something. So I'm trying to, mm-hmm. I went three, three or four times. Oh, that's amazing. That's, uh, um, it, it strikes me so like interesting and wonderful when, <clears throat> and this probably still happens now, but like in the 90s when I was a hip hop dancer, a lot of the um, the guys would get flown to Japan to teach families and then they would teach schools or whatever. And I'm like, what? We can, that's a thing, you know? So when I read that you went to China to teach improv, I'm like, that's a thing? But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there are people like Will Hines, who's ridiculously talented. He, I mm-hmm. think, travels quite a bit. Like there are a couple improvisers that have been around the world doing this and, you know, yeah further places than I have. Um, yeah. So for me, it worked out. Cause also like we were taken care of, I had a hotel room. I didn't have to like sleep Oof. on someone's couch, yeah. not to be like a dick, but also not going, going to a foreign country where I don't speak the language. I'm like, I yeah. need a hotel room. No, I don't want to sleep. Yeah. Or a part yeah, of it. Yes. That's, that has to be something. Um, Absolutely. but there are definitely a few improvisers who do that and are very good at it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about your one woman show, which I have yet to see. And um, well, tell us about, tell us the name of it. Just tell us about the show, how it started, how long it's been running. Do you do anything with it now that we're in quarantine? But I was. You- um, uh, I think I love improv. And I think this happens, at least it happened in my case, where you get mm-hmm. um, not burned out, but you kind of have to find something new about it to love. And I think the benefit of teaching is I would have to teach yes and so much that I'd be reminded of like, oh yeah, go back to the basics, yes and. I would teach object work and then, oh yeah, enjoy object work. So I tended to always have a love for improv. I never really had those like lulls of hating it, which I have like, I think we all know people that kind of hit their peak of like, they need to take a few months off or something. Mm -hmm. So I think teaching helped me with that. So then... um, I was just trying to challenge myself and challenge myself. And I had a couple two hands that I really liked. Um, and I love a mono scene. And I don't know, I just kept trying to challenge myself and how can I do more? How can I take it to the next step? And then I was like, why don't I just do solo improv? I'd heard that someone had, I saw someone do it in Toronto once on a, on a, in a comedy festival uh-huh. and I hadn't seen it since. And Ian Roberts uh, like talks to the audience and just like that's his improv one man show where he'll just ask for suggestions and then tell stories and I was like oh okay so then I wrote him and I was like can you coach me wow cold and yeah yes there used to be I knew him he also got me my first manager he was very sweet 
Okay. And um, believed in me and like that helped me get my first commercial oh. in LA. Got me my SAG card. Um, so yeah, so I wrote him and I didn't know how he would respond. And he was like, yeah, let's come to UCB. And so I went to UCB and I was on the stage and he's in the audience empty and he's like, okay, go. And it was oh. scary. So I started with the pretty flower and then I started doing the Herald. And then that was just too much brain power, to be honest, yeah. to play like the Herald was like multiple characters, multiple games, having to already think of an analogous suggestion while you're in the scene. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was so much work that I could do a 10 minute set. Then I could do a 12, 15 minute set. And so I slowly had to build it out. I only met with him a few times. And I remember one of his notes was like, your men are very like, oh, <laughs> Like just whatever note he would give me and be like, okay, yeah, my men are like, I open my legs and I deepen my voice. Um, so yeah, so then I just started practicing it at home. I like film myself and I give myself notes because I'm like, well, that's what I do for a living. So right. yeah, fuck it. Yeah, and I'm a hard critic on myself. So yeah, I started practicing it at home. And then from there, I started putting up at indie shows. And yeah. So uh, I love it. It is a challenge that I'm, yeah, I'm all in for. Mm -hmm. It really brings me a lot of joy. And now I found my piece with it as a mono scene. Because in a mono scene, I can play, I play around six to eight characters. So each of them has a game. Then the world has one or two games. So I always have some, I can just jump around. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so for people who don't know improv, there you talked about the Herald. And so the Herald has is, is just from my brain right now, I, I think if I practiced it and did it more often, I would grasp it much quicker, but talk about what the Herald is and then the mono scene, which we kind of talked about that right. with another person, but I'll have you talk about it as well. Um, the Herald is just a structure. I believe Del Close created it to do improv. So it's like a bunch of like two person scenes into a group scene and then back to seeing those two person scenes later in time. Mm -hmm. um, and then a group scene again. Um, I think it's taught, it's used at most schools to teach improv. It's almost like draw within the lines, learn how to do that. Then let's remove the lines and do whatever you want. So I think okay. people learn within that structure. And then once you get, once you understand Herald, you can do scenes, you can do group scenes. You know what I mean? You can, you have a lot of um, tools in your belt mm -hmm. and then you can do whatever you want. A mono scene is one scene. So it'd be just one long scene that takes place in one moment of time. So there are no mm -hmm. cuts to the future or to the past. Mm -hmm. I said pretty flower before, which would be cutting, jumping around in time. And so I like the mono scene because we live in the nuanced moments. So I think you can get a lot of comedy from silence or from like looks, you know, from like sitting with the weight of what was said, mm -hmm. um, which is very different because uh, UCB, I do think is like a faster theater and I love doing fast improv, mm -hmm. but there's something nice about that. So yeah, I don't know if that's like a good way to describe it. Those would be those yeah. different forms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they're not so then, depending on openings too. Go for it. No. So, oh, so just for clarity, because I, I can kind of see it. Um, mono scene so basically your one woman show is people come they're sitting in the audience and then you take suggestions and then you do um you play out a story based on that suggestion in a mono scene yeah i started doing it off of a word and i realized it didn't make sense to the audience mm -hmm. like they were like you just took a word and did this whole thing so i realized it, it works better to either get a couple words from the audience or get um a little more of a suggestion so they can see the su suggestion come to life on stage okay. um yeah so i started doing that and is there more to that my dog barked and i'm sorry i got distracted by him oh. <laughs> being, he's just being a butt Go. oh he's barking <laughs> he's, he's actually what he's doing is he's trying to tell you that you forgot some some bits of information no i don't know yeah probably he's like ah, uh, you missed a couple years yeah uh, yeah okay, exactly um but yeah okay so then Great. So then we, so right now it's the, how did you phrase it? It's the only one woman improv show in Hollywood. I started saying one person because why gender me? Uh, I don't know. Um, one of the few I've, I've heard, like I heard Jen, Jason Manzoukas has done a couple. I've heard, I, I know Indie Nights, I've been doing it for a while. And then I noticed Indie Nights started doing like, do a five minute one person show. So I've seen it start to be a little bit more popular but mm -hmm. when i started it i'm not saying it was the first because i remember seeing a guy do it years ago 
-hmm. and Ian Roberts does, does his own version. So I know there are a few people floating around, but nobody does it regularly. So yeah, mine has been like the regular show for the past few years. Yeah. And you would do it at UCB like once a month? I would do it wherever I could get up on stage, to be honest. Got it. Mm -hmm. so I did indie nights. UCB, there's some wonderful like teams that have let me just jump on and perform. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been fortunate where teams have been like, yes, you can come play. So they'll give me a time and then I can just jump and do it. So I've been yeah. doing that. Um, yeah. So that was nice. Mm -hmm. I love it. And so now during the quarantine, you said that you started to do a few things. Were you doing like Zoom shows or? Yeah, I did my one woman on Zoom and like backed away so I could act it out. And then I was doing indie nights so that I could still, you know, do improv because especially it's been a part of our lives for how long. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, I got COVID, so I was sick for a while. So I didn't, oh, I didn't know that. perform. Yeah. So mm -hmm. then I didn't perform for quite a while, yeah. about two months of being sick. Um, yeah. And now, now I'm doing like indie night stuff and I'm, <laughs> Uh, I've started, I started a podcast and I'm also recording because I rehearse my <laughs> woman alone. So I started recording my rehearsals of doing them to release them. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that the name goes. Of the podcast. Hey. Uh, my podcast is called sick and it's talking to people about illness and how they found the light <laughs> in it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Cause I, my yeah. history of illness is pretty deep, um, and heavy, but mm -hmm. I'm funny not yeah. because of it, but I have empathy in my comedy. You know what I mean? I'm able to like be grateful for a day where I, I, I feel healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think having that perspective has helped me as an actor in the characters I've played and helped me. And so I wanted to talk to people who have illnesses or have had or have suffered and how yeah. it has helped their creativity because there's so much shame like, I remember when I was sick, it's not like I could be like, oh, yeah, guys, I can't hang out after. I don't feel good. Like, you couldn't do that. I just didn't tell anybody and would sit in the pain because there's this weird, I think it's multi-layered. I think there's a sexist shame of, like, a female not feeling good on top of, like, as a performer, if you don't feel good, then they cast somebody else. So I couldn't tell yeah. producers on TV shows I was on. On yeah. top of, like, I remember in high school when I was sick all the time, my friends would be like, oh, of course you're going to cancel. And it becomes oh, this, like, no. they didn't know. Yeah. they're teenagers. They, you know, yeah. all of us were selfish at the time. So I'm not judging yeah. them. I love them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's been nice to talk to people about what their personal struggle was, sort of like what we're learning about with Black Panther with Chadwick, where you're like, yeah. this man was suffering and nobody knew and look how much he did. Right. Because if he had shared that, it would be called, you know, Black Panther, oh yeah, and cancer. Every conversation yes. would have talked about cancer. And instead he gave children and adults, the freedom to just look up to this hero without throwing in any illness with it. Right. Yeah. The bravery and right. like selflessness that, selflessness that took of him. Mm -hmm. So I like so far the people I've interviewed have like sex addiction, depression, mm -hmm. you know, and then different like um, illnesses or going to therapy and stuff and just how that has made them a better musician or made them a better actor or sort of given them clarity with what their, their, uh, point of view is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I kind of, where can we find that? Where can we find the podcast? I haven't released it yet. I'm finishing interviewing a okay. few more people. Okay. I don't know. I love that you're doing weekly. I don't know how you do it. How many people you've had to interview? <laughs> um, well, it started off where I was going to do it daily. And then once, once I started doing this, it's like, girl, you are, that's too ambitious. Cut it out. That's so, um, so, so yeah. Um, but I, I'm very, uh, I, I'm, ex I'm, I'm excited to hear, I think it's a great idea. I don't, I haven't heard anything like that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist because my little world is my little world. But um, yeah, I, I know a couple of people who live with autoimmune diseases and still have to push through and then have to make excuses for, for the sake of the other person to feel better. Meanwhile, they're in pain. Um, so yeah, I look forward to, to that. I, maybe I'll just wait. Do, do you have, I'll just wait and release this when that comes up so then we can Ooh. tie it all in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm doing a few more interviews and then I was going to release one a week. I don't know. Okay. Like you're yeah. doing, but I can't, yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I don't know how you're I, doing this money. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. No, I love the idea and I love, I love the title. It's dope. Um, <laughs> so let me see. I had a question. Okay, so, so you talked about how Ian had gotten you your first manager, which led to, so at that time, 
although you were teaching and you were performing all over town and you had seen some other people while you were in Toronto um, being on commercials, left leave, left Toronto, came, came to LA, now on commercials. So you came here for television. And so then how did that trajectory start to get into the world of acting? Um, I think I got a commercial agent first and then Funny or Die at the time was a much different thing than it is now, right? It was a big deal mm. to be in their videos. So I think right. I started doing some of those and being a bit in them. And then because I was on a mod team, we would write sketches and I can't remember if we put them all up with Funny or Die, but we would have some sort of connection to getting them up online. Mm -hmm. um, and then Ian, I don't even remember why. I think I had done some show and he had seen me and he was like, I'm going to recommend you to Principato at the time. Mm -hmm. And I met with Principato. Yeah. And they were very kind to me and like, Ian doesn't, you're the second person he's ever recommended. So they took right. a meeting. Quite discerning. Yeah. Yeah. And he is, he's a, he's a kind, kind man, but he has like an energy to him. Um, and then from that, they were like, look, we're going to put you as an extra in this. I've told the story before, but this Pepsi commercial and it was Will Arnett, Will, mm, got another Will, um, Andy Daly, a whole bunch of all the, Rob Hubel, all of those dudes. Um, it turned, Ithmar was an extra. This is why I talked about with Ithmar. Um, and I was an extra and stuff. And then all day we're just extras sitting in the background. And then at one point I sit next to Rob Hubel and I kind of just took a risk. And when the, they did this long shot where they like cut to someone, cut to someone, cut to Rob, he said a line to me. And then I said a very dirty line in response. Um, and they cut and people started walking up to him to shake his hand, just being like, holy fuck so brilliant and he was like i didn't do that that was monica and then i'm in the commercial I'm, I'm the button for the commercial um everyone was nice to me all of a sudden you go from like an extra to oh she's funny yeah and that that got me my sad card and that prince of auto heard about that because they were like maybe we'll sign you why don't you do this thing and so i was like i gotta do something yeah so yeah and then i started working like booking guest stars pretty consistently mm -hmm. yeah for a while um back and forth thing and then you know again illness gets in the way at times so then I couldn't work um yeah uh and then trying to like change my type was a thing for a while oh Cause... talk about that why were you why were you trying to change your type because or I what was, was just... your type and then you were changing it too I mean now I'm back to that blonde but like I was the dumb bimboy woman girl mm -hmm. I was booking a lot and like half dressed and stuff and I get it I yeah. look a certain way um and I could be funny in it and I liked it but I was hitting this point where I want to be seen as more than that yeah so I tried to like change my hair and change my type and start like being seen as a different type of entity <laughs> that would be hard because I would book something and they'd be like can you go back to blonde <laughs> so then I would book it and then okay and then go back to dying it blonde anyways because they right. wanted that type of woman um and then at the same time I was also going through illness stuff again because it, it heated up at one point um yeah so now that's why at the beginning we were chatting I was like I want to go back to what feels me so I went back to the super blonde again I understand and as you bring that up um I'm thinking about the first thing that comes to mind is your role in Blunt Talk, where you play opposite Patrick Stewart. You were his girlfriend, right? Uh, I'm, I'm Adrian Scarborough's girlfriend, so oh, the other that's lead. Right. But that's I live right. with Patrick Stewart on the show. That's what it was. And what I loved about that character is that she was this aesthetically beautiful kind of dippy blonde, but she was like, what were you, a science major or something? You Yeah, I think I got into NYU. <laughs> I think they end my character with like me going into some program. Yeah. Yeah. She was very intelligent. Yeah. They like, yeah, that was just a well-written, uh, yeah, very, well very well-written show. Um, and a wonderful cast, all very sweet and loving. Yeah. The entire very cast nice. was hilarious. I, I was, I was mad that it didn't continue on, but so was Yeah. Always. There's also something about like, as a guest star, you get to read energies because you join a family, you know, you join the family of regulars who've bonded and connected. Mm -hmm. And this was such a show where they just, I'm in a, a bunch of episodes, but they were very kind of me like, you're part of us. Yeah. And I think they did like that ev with everyone else who I know who was a guest star. We all were just like, you're part of the community. And we still all are connected online in some capacity. It was really nice. 
Mm-hmm. It's nice when you yeah. work on those shows where like everyone is sweet, talented, kind. Yeah, yeah like, because we're having, I mean, what we're doing is really fun and there's no need to be a dick, but sometimes people are. Yeah. Um, and so, so with that, with that particular audition, like what was it like to, to go in for that role? Was, was it already on the page? No, it was a, it was a one liner. It was a one. And then I improvised in the room. (sighs) Something like that happened. Yeah. 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 Cause it was just one episode thing and ended up being like two seasons of it. Um, yeah. So I was fortunate that way to have that, like they, he liked the character and let me continue Mm -hmm. to play it. Um, yeah. So that's okay. So, so that's, that's such a great story. I'm glad I asked that question because now we're, I'm starting to see this pattern, you know, with you because you've, you're just such a, a well-oiled machine as an improviser, starting at 19, doing your own shows, going from Toronto, China, LA. And um, so now it's just a natural thing for you to just throw in a line or two and improvise something. And then now it allows you to get this Pepsi job or, or expand that. Or, and then now blunt talk. And I don't know if there's been other things along the way where it's just like, I'm just going to improvise something. Cause I feel like it's, it's warranted right here. Additionally. I mean, I haven't now with the quarantine, it's so weird to be like, what are auditions again? Um, I definitely like an audition, which is a thing to learn to do. Right. Like as an yeah. actor, you know it, where you have to like, skill. it's a skill to like it. And I think I just yeah. found improvise before, <laughs> before this, the page after the page depending on what kind of show it is or how comfortable I feel with casting or if I've worked with them before then I might feel a little bit more open and sometimes I'll ask them in the room like how how you know what I mean like how loose can I go because some people want it to the page which of course right yeah I think it's helpful that worked for me but that's also like you know like that's my skill set so yeah I definitely try to utilize it in the room when I can Yeah. yeah Yeah, it's fun. Man, that's great. So, so, um, so, what are you doing to stay creative during quarantine, if at all? Um, I mean, it's been a road, right? Yeah. Like when this first started, it was like, okay, clear out the house. I was yeah. doing my one woman show on Zoom, so it was like, okay, mm-hmm. perform. Um, started playing the ukulele again because I, I used to play. play I know. I did it for a musical sketch and then it sits in my apartment. So I was like, let's do that. Then I started sewing again. Cause let's do, you know, we're like every artsy hobby comes back around. Yeah, it does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I but painting, I started crocheting. Yeah. Yeah. Same painting. And then also I got sick. So mm-hmm. then that took over for like two months. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just, uh, it's weird. Cause the world is grieving and yeah. especially America. And I think seeing, what's happening and how people are being killed and like Mm -hmm. every day by police. There's like, there's so many levels where I would love to, and I recognize my privilege as a white woman. I hope as much as I can be Mm -hmm. where I'm not in that same boat, but to see it happen every day and feel helpless. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's hard to like, I think there's something to admit about like, there are days where you don't get as much done the, the, like financially you're right. not working since March essentially right. aside yeah. from a couple teaching things or like and then you're watching the world fall apart you're watching your friends be afraid to go for a walk at night yeah. or wear a hoodie like just things right. where yeah so accepting all of that I would I think I want to connect with people who aren't getting as much done, especially if you're also worrying about rent being paid or you're worried about healthcare and what SAG's doing or or whatever version of it is. And then also, thankfully, I've been writing. Mm -hmm. When this started, I wrote a bunch of quarantine trailers for the movies that will be once the quarantine is done. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, so that took up time because I wrote a bunch that way. You know, (laughs) I would do some dumb videos and then... Now I'm just back to writing. Yeah, so trying to spend my time mm-hmm. writing again. I pitched a show with a friend, so we've been doing that. That's great. Yeah, it's like, it's a weird thing because I see people who are selling shows and doing all this, mm-hmm. and you can't compare yourself to that because it's nope. everyone's yeah. in a different position, and yeah, yeah. this is grief. And then also getting sick is scary or being afraid of people living in fear having not gotten sick yet or hopefully mm-hmm. never. Yeah. Like I just imagine... It's a lot. 
Right. It's 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 like um, I want to liken it to like a, a Molotov cocktail because it's like one minute it's unlit and it's fine and it's dormant and then something comes up and strikes the a match to it and then it's explosive and and the rage of emotions that we're all feeling it's 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 a wonder that we're able to still be okay but you know we are human beings and we're resilient so we continue on but it's just one minute you're like i remember one week uh pharrell williams released this great video and i was like just feeling just, just ebullient and just excited and then the next week chad would die and it was just like what you know so it's just been all these ups and downs and we just have creativity peek through and do what it does when it does and i imagine everyone's triggered in so many different ways you know what i mean like i know i'm personally triggered illness wise mm -hmm. like watching the chadwick thing obviously an amazing actor and like a profound like choices in the roles he played also for me personally him hiding his illness connected yeah. with me who hid mine for yeah. years until now i'm finally really talking about it you know yeah. so like you're being triggered in ways you may not fully recognize or knowing people are losing their parents right. or losing right. i have i have friends who've lost friends yeah. who are our age right. so it's like two covid so you're like oh all that's happening people moving and leaving i think there's so many the racism yeah. is uh, the KKK just heavy. like this it's heavy. crazy yeah. it's so heavy and I think all of us have our own personal stories on top of that so I think our own little traumas mm -hmm. so yeah I definitely am learning like one don't take anything personally right now because everyone is going through it exactly yeah and just yeah and just operate the best way you can with extreme self-care if that's really it, extreme self-care whatever that may be I will say like, uh, I mean, I've been meditating since I was young because of illness. So I like connected with that, yeah. but, um, that's also part of the reason why I wanted to do that podcast. Cause even like right now it's like, how do you find the light in all this? Right. And if I hadn't been sick before, would I be handling this so well? Maybe not. You know, if I hadn't yeah. been through some struggles, would I know to have therapy right, right now? Like, right. you know, to be grateful right. for the hardships because now we have this perspective mm -hmm. not in any way to say people should be grateful that they have all this shit happening to them because we shouldn't be um but personally how do i find a like somewhat positive perspective right my phone alarm just went off and I how dare you how dare you my dog has been quiet this whole time i know What's your you phone doing? yeah he left finally oh I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about Felix. Well, 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 then we can end on this. Um, yeah, tell us about Felix. He's a hairless beast. He's a wonder. <laughs> um, I got him because I got really sick. And I hit this point where I was like, I live in LA. Let's finally commit. I, I like drove a shitty car that I was very proud to drive, a Nissan NX uh, 1981 T roof. It was scratched up, and I was like, I don't need to own things because I would travel and like perform, and I loved this life. Yeah. And then I got really ill again um, for a while, mm -hmm. and it hit me of like, what am I waiting to do? Ooh. You know how we wait for a career before you have a relationship, or you wait for exactly. your career? Yeah, it's happening I was, now. Right? Yeah. It's like, so live in the moment. And I was like, well, I always wanted a dog. I can't have a dog because I'm allergic. Mm -hmm. So then I took months. I think it took me eight months to find him, to find, mm -hmm. understand a breed I could have, which is a hairless little mm -hmm. Sholo. Um, and then find him specifically. Oh. And he's been great. They're like yeah. the smart, smartest dog. He's from Coco for people who know he the dog that way. It's a spirit animal. It, it connects with the sick. So it has oh, like this beautiful, yeah, the, the animal has a beautiful history um, mm -hmm. to it. Frida always painted this beast. Um, yeah. And it, yeah. So I don't know, like for anyone who has a pet, especially now, I'm also single right now. I know you have someone that you're with during this quarantine, but yeah. to be a, alone in this quarantine, to have a pet is like. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have, think about that. Um, it's like, what would it be like to be, because most of my time in LA, I've been here like you 15 years. Most of my time has been single. It's been these past, I think, I don't even know what year. I'm bad with dates too. Maybe it's <laughs> three or four years. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I was like, yeah, I probably would have gone home. I probably, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? But I can only imagine. And having, 
um, a little partner and an animal has to be helpful. Yeah, just to, also he brings people joy. You know, when you yeah, walk down does. the street and everyone, and people do this with all dogs, but people look at your dog and they smile and you're like, okay, yeah, that's lovely. Cause I look at people's babies and smile. Yeah. Or I look at someone's dog and think how cute, you know, we all enjoy a dog video now and then. So it's like, cool. He brings me joy and I'm sure he must in his weirdness bring other people. Yeah. Yeah. His, his Instagram page brings me joy and that's my <laughs> pastime. Um, crazy cats and crazy dogs on okay. Instagram. That's I'm, I'm looking for them so I can yeah, right. light back up. Oh, I will send you a fun video I found recently. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But thank you for, for um, joining me, Monica. This yeah, it was lovely. Great talk. Um, I really enjoy I, I look forward to Sick, the podcast. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, I look forward it. to seeing this. It's also nice to see you for a while. I was seeing you almost weekly. So it's nice to see your smiling yeah. face and to know you're Same doing here. well. Yeah. Well, thanks, Monica. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching Creatives in Quarantine. I'm excited for Monica's new podcast, Sick, launching next month, February 2020. Follow her and Felix on Instagram. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and like if you like this interview. Until next time, bye.